you're sitting there and you feel completely exposed. Um, you have one of those little gowns on where people can see on the back and the doctors made you sit on that little table where the paper sticks to you. And you're like, what is going on here? They've been running tests and he wanted to check out a few things on his own and he walks out of the room and seems like an eternity goes by and finally they come back in and the doctor abruptly proclaims, I don't know how to tell you this, but but you have two weeks left to live. That's it. Two weeks. How do you respond to that? How would you respond to that? Now, many of us would probably respond by disbelief. We'd be like, there's no way. I feel great. Come on, doc. You've got to be wrong. And we'd spend those two weeks trying to get a second and a third and a fourth opinion on the thing. Some of us might be alerted to the fact that we haven't got our house in order and so we're going and frantically trying to make sure we, we've got a will and we got things designated and we tell everybody that we love where things are so they can access them and get to them when they need them. Some of us might be going on what I would call the friends and family tour where we're heading everywhere in the entire country where we have friends and family so we can tell them we love them before two weeks runs out. Some of us might think to ourselves, you know what? I have never seen the Grand Canyon or Hawaii or Europe. And I'm heading that way right now. I've only got a short amount of time. I want to go see those things. A few of us might be thinking, I've been trying to get in shape all these years. I'm going to go eat Cinnabon every single day. That is going to be my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm going to go out with a bang. <laughs> You might even think to yourself, I'm going to share Jesus unashamed. What do I have to lose now? I'm going to tell people about Him. I'm going to let them know who He is. I'm going to share that I have hope even in the face of this terrible diagnosis, this short amount of time. I am going to live without fear even if it's only for these last two, thing, two weeks. I really don't know how you'd respond. I really don't know how I would respond. At least not completely. But one thing I know for sure is that we would realize just how valuable time is. Every minute of every day, every second of our existence, we would recognize is an invaluable gift from God. And in fact, we would probably realize just how important things are. And we would put relationships at the top. Relationship with God. Relationship with Jesus. Relationship with others. We would realize just how important those things are. Paul sits here in prison or under house arrest, as it were. But at any moment, Caesar essentially can say... Pfft, Put him to death. Put him to death. The axe essentially is hanging over his head. And at any moment, at any time, he could just be put out of his misery, as it were. And Paul's response to that is to say, to live as Christ and to die as gain. To live as Christ and to die as gain. How many of us could say that? To live as Christ and to die as gain. The doctor comes in. To live as Christ. To die, that's game. Nina Hammond is the executive editor of the Southeast Outlook in Louisville, Kentucky. But in 1988, she worked on a, as a reporter on a small uh, newspaper in Lebanon, Kentucky. And on May 14th of that year of 1988, newspapers throughout the country carried a story about a bus crash uh, where 24 children and three adults died. And it was called the worst uh, drunk driver uh, accident in Kentucky history. The bus was carrying the youth group of First Assembly of God Church in Radcliffe, Kentucky. And though uh, 90, 90 did not cover the story, many of her friends were reporters uh, in that county, and they had uh, taken the accounts from the children that were there that had survived the crash. And some of the witnesses of the crash told of one particular event that happened, one particular a passenger on that bus, and that passenger's name was Chuck Kaida. I hope I said it right. He was the youth minister of the church. And Chuck was seated at the front of the bus behind the driver when the gas tank exploded, 
just a heartbeat after the collision happened. And he was instantly encircled by flames. And when Chuck saw the flames around him, witnesses said that he looked up, he lifted his hands and cried out, Jesus, I'm coming home. And some of the children reported seeing a smile on his face as he said that. And Niney wrote, I was not a Christian in 1988, so I couldn't make any sense of what Chuck did. Here's this guy so cool that a bunch of kids called him Banana. Standing in flames moments before a horrible death, and he's smiling. And no matter how hard she tried, Niney could not erase from her mind the image of Chuck. And she wrote, the only way to explain how a man could calmly accept, almost welcome, a painful death was to acknowledge that he understood something, some great truth that I didn't. That he had something, faith, hope, God maybe, but something that I didn't have. And try as I might, I couldn't help but yearn for whatever he had that made death a thing to embrace rather than a thing to fear. Two years later... Niney would come to Christ, and she says, Chuck Kaida planted a seed in me that took root in my heart. And one day I will see Chuck in heaven, and I'll tell him the manner of his death pointed me toward eternal life. The manner of his death pointed me to eternal life. There's something so powerful, so urgent, so exciting, so joyful in knowing that we can face death without fear. It is transformative to know that, that we can face death and not be, even to one degree, scared of what may come because of what Jesus has done in our lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, it says this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like the people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with Him the believers who have died. I want you to understand that text tells you and me that we have this hope that passes by death. Death doesn't mean anything to us. In fact, it really just ushers us in to the very eternity in the presence of God that we all are looking for. That should promote in us a boldness and an urgency and excitement and a joy as we live this life. So how do we find this joy that even death cannot disrupt? Well, for that, I want to look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. If not, it will also be on the screen. I want to read to you the entirety of verse 18, or at least the second half of verse 18 through verse 26. This is what it says. Yes, Paul says, yes, and I will rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ that this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. We look at Paul's words here. And some of us might have to admit that we really don't have the same view of life and death. We look at Paul's words here and we, we might have to admit to ourselves that, that we are more likely to cling to this life and be more worried about the next than we should be. Years ago, Christians were asked by Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, are you going to heaven? Christians were asked, are you going to heaven? And 80% of them answered in the same way. Does anyone know what their answer was? 80% of Christians, what was their answer? I hope so. 
I hope so. I hope so? That's your answer? Well, I hope so. Well, I know so, and you should know so. Paul knew so, and you should know so. You should know so. See, Paul shows no hesitancy here. He speaks with confidence. He proclaims to everyone who will listen, I am in a win-win situation. If I'm here serving the Lord, win. If I die and go to heaven, win. Win-win situation. And all Christians should recognize that. Interestingly enough to me, he starts off with this, this passage and he ends this passage by proclaiming joy. He starts off, I rejoice, and he says, I'm hanging around for your joy. 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 So how do we get to that place? How can we smile in the face of death? How can we rejoice when life is fleeing or fleeting, I should say? Well, I think Paul gives us a pretty good outline of what we ought to do in our text this morning. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to have confidence in God's power. We need to just have confidence in God. Listen to what he says, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He is confident. Paul mentions here prayer because he knows that prayer is a powerful thing because God is listening and God can and will answer us. This isn't just some kind of first step that you take to get out of the way. Well, we're going to pray for the service today. We got that out of the way. Now let's move on to the singing. No, this is access to the very one who has all power, who is all powerful in our midst. This is the most important step to pray, to pray. Paul sees prayer having real power to change our lives, to change things around us. It affects uh, everything throughout our life. He, he's not the only one who proclaims this. James says the same thing about the power of prayer. In James chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Confess your sins to each other. That's a different sermon. We'll get to that one day. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then he says, The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. James says prayer is powerful. Powerful. The early church believed this. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the Word of God with boldness. Jesus says it, Matthew chapter 21, verses 21 and 22. Truly I say to you, if you have faith to do, to do and not doubt, you will not only do what, we have been do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. I want you to understand, we don't ask for prayer because we think, well, that's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. We ask for prayer. We participate in prayer because we are confident in God's power. It's always been about God's power. Not us. How often have we just turned prayer into a checked off item on a list? instead of realizing that the Almighty, the All-Powerful, the All-Knowing God is there to help us. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that, we, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In his book, in Worry Less, Live More, or excuse me, the book Worry Less, Live More, Robert J. Morgan illustrates uh, the fact that many in society are very conscious of their anxiety. Did you know that Amazon keeps track of everything you highlight in an ebook? You buy an ebook in Amazon and you highlight anything in that book, they keep track of it. They know you've done it. A few years ago, they put out a list of the most popular passage from some of their best-selling books, you know, The Hunger Games, Harry Potter, Pride and Prejudice. But they also put out what the most highlighted passage in the Bible was. Now, you might think you already know what it is. You might think, well, I, surely it was John 3, 16. Or, or surely it was someone highlighted Psalm 23. Or maybe someone highlighted the Lord's Prayer, you know, the, 
the, the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. It wasn't any of those. Instead, it was a passage out of our very letter today, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think that's so powerful. People understand that there are stressors in life, but you need to take those to God because He can provide peace, joy, power, healing, help, and all of those things. Paul was not afraid of death, and he wasn't afraid of what life might throw at him either because he was confident in the God's power. What about you and me? Are we confident in God's power? The doctor gives you bad news. Are you still confident in the Lord? North Korea builds a, a rocket that can bring a nuke all the way to our shores. Are you still confident in the Lord? The financial markets shake or the financial markets succeed. Are you confident in the Lord? Are you confident in the Lord? Your company's going to downsize. Some kind of natural disaster hits. Are you confident in the Lord? See, whatever you face, God has the power to provide. And truth be told, He has already provided. Already. Through the promise of eternity. In fact, I remembered another prayer. I'm not going to read it to you today. I would encourage you to read it. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3. But in that prayer, Paul says that I... Pray that you would understand that God is able to do more than you could think up or dream up. Do we believe in that God? Paul lives in God's power. What about me? What about you? That's the first thing. We need to have confidence in God's power. The second thing is we need to have confidence in God's purpose. We need to have confidence in God's purpose. Confidence in God's purpose purpose. I like what he says in verse 25 and 26. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. I love Paul. He says, whether I live or die, I will do either one for Jesus. God's purpose for my life, Paul says. Is to live for Him. That's the same purpose for us. Our purpose in life should be whether I live or die, I am going to bring glory to Jesus. I'm going to do everything I can to bring glory to Jesus. I'm going to do everything I can to spread the joy that I have found with those around me who do not know about it. Paul would love to be in the very presence of God but he is excited to be able to be used to bring the joy of the Lord to others. He is living or dying confident in God's purpose. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I love this verse. If you do not memorize this or haven't memorized this, memorize this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has plans for you and me to prosper, to bring hope. If we embrace that truth, if we trust in the Lord, then we are free to really live in joy when we know that God has got it. I love what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He says, we are God's masterpieces. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things. And listen to what he says, things that he'd planned for us long ago things that He had planned for us long ago. Harvard professor James Wood in a New, York, a New Yorker article entitled, Is That All There Is?, tells of a friend, a philosopher, and a convinced atheist who sometimes wakes up in the middle of the night haunted by this following angst. 
How can it be that the world is the result of an accidental big bang? How could there be no design, no metaphysical purpose? Can it be that every life beginning with my own, my husband's, my child's, and spreading outward is cosmically irrelevant? Wood, who is a secular man himself, admits that as one gets older and pa uh, parents and peers begin to die and the obituaries in the newspapers are no longer missives from a faraway place, but local letters, and one's own projects seem ever more pointless and e uh, ephemeral, such moments of terror and incomprehension seem more frequent and more piercing and I find as likely to rise in the middle of the day as to come in the night. What is this incomprehension that can suddenly grip even secular people? Wood's friend's questions reveal more an intuition than a line of reasoning. It is a sense that we are more, that there is more in life. There's more than just this material world. In fact, Steve Jobs, when com contemplating his own death, confessed that he felt like it's. Er, that he felt this. He says, it's strange to think that you accumulate all this experience and it just goes away. So I really want to believe that something survives that maybe your consciousness endures. It seemed to Jobs untrue to reality that for something as significant as human life itself, death should be an off switch that could merely click and you're gone. So many people live in that place, no purpose, no hope, no realization that, that God has a plan for our lives and they're living in hopelessness. And they have this nagging feeling. They're yearning for something more. And we have that. And yet so often we live in hopelessness. And Paul says you should live in confidence. You have that. You know God's plan for your life. We know there's so much more than just this. We know that God has given us purpose, but we don't often live like we know it. Instead of boldness and passion, instead of stepping out on faith and doing great things, we live in fear, paralyzed to attempt anything. Paul looks death in the face and he says, if you come, death, I win. And if you delay death, I still win. When? And we should say the same. Paul knows God has purpose for his life. Do you understand that God has purpose for your life too? You're sitting there in that I see you gown. <laughs> that, if anybody comes in there, they see you. And the doctor gives you that news. You've got two weeks to live. How are you going to respond? How would you respond? James 4 verse 14 says this, While you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Any way you slice it, whether the doctor comes in and says you have two weeks to live or not, Life is short. We don't need to spend our days chasing time. Instead, we need to spend our days following God. If that becomes our goal, whether we live or we die, we can still live as victors in God filled with joy. And it's time for us as a church and as individuals to start living with great confidence in God's power and God's purpose for our lives and our church. If you live in both of those things, God's power and God's purpose, then you find real joy. Then you find real joy. I want to close by reading a benediction. This is Richard Halverson's benediction. He was the former minister at Fourth Presbyterian Church in Bethesda, Maryland. He was also the former chaplain at the United States Senate. And he used this benediction at the end of, for years, at the end of every one of the services he was a part of. So I'm going to leave us with this benediction this morning. And this is what he said, and I think it's so powerful. He says, wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, 
God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being right where you are. Christ, who indwells you by the power of His Spirit, wants to do something in and through you. Believe this and go in grace. Go in His grace, His love, His power. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.